Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Okay. Um, I've had a bit of a, an epiphany these last uh, few weeks, probably because, like um, Jenny was saying, we've, we did the Halloween event, and uh, we got to thinking about, you know, people who had gone before. It makes you think a bit, doesn't it? And uh, the reason why it made me think is because my mum's mum, she actually passed away at 59. Now, I'm 59, and uh, it's amazing how suddenly you get a link and you think, ooh, 59. And uh, so if I have the same lifespan as her, well, then I haven't got very long. Ha-ha, <laughs> fooled you. Um, and then I got to thinking about my father. He died at 70. So if I have the same lifespan as him, I've got 11 years. Ooh. Now, it makes you start to think. Now, I'm not wanting to be morbid or anything, but what Jenny was just saying, what are we doing then with our lives? Now, the reason why I said I've had a bit of an epiphany is because... Um, over the last few years, I have allowed myself to get intimidated. Um, the journey that I have been on in a faith way has been very different to what I've known for most of my life. Now, that is quite a scary thing because I was born into a Christian family where things were already set in motion for how things were going to be. And, uh, of course, I just went along with it. And whether we like it or not, we get carried along. And there comes a point where we have to ask questions about what is it that I believe, not what is it that just parents have given us. And that takes a lot of courage. And uh, we're not just talking about it in faith terms. If you want to do something that is different from the way your family have been... For instance, I'll give you a perfect example. My uh, husband's family uh, were miners. And um, if you didn't go down the mine, you weren't being faithful to the family because that's what the family did. Now, there was another uh, group of people in, in, in Anne's uh, family who what they did was go in the army. And if you didn't go in the army, you weren't being faithful. And it was like doing something different. You know, it was like weird. So don't think that it's just about faith issues. We're very much influenced um, <clears throat> by others. And um, there are times when we have to wake up ourselves to what is it that we understand. And I have lots of conversations with some of you who say, you know, something's not quite gelling and fitting for me. And it's because you're waking up. You're thinking for yourself. And it's amazing. But um, I saw this. Um, uh, do you want to put the first slide up, please? Hopefully we, we can have a bit of fun tonight as well. It was this. Every box of raisins is a tragic tale of grapes that could have been wine. Do you like that? Now, if you don't like wine, carry on being a raisin. <laughs> I don't mind. I happen to like wine. I'm very particular. I only like a certain sort. But I like that. Now, this really hit me because um, I have recognized in this epiphany that I'm 59 and I sometimes think I'm a raisin rather than a a bottle of wine. Because sometimes I let things intimidate me. I remember watching a, a program not so long ago, and some of you may have seen it. It might be a bit out there for some, but it was called The Path. And um, this guy who was out of a particular religious organization, he suddenly came to the recognition that he didn't believe the things that he'd been taught to believe. He'd suddenly thought, this doesn't add up and I don't believe it anymore. And he went home after a retreat to his family 
And his wife knew the moment that he walked through the door that he was different. And she's going, there's something wrong. What's wrong with you? No, no, he's saying nothing, nothing at all. There is, there's something wrong. You've had an affair. You've had an affair, she said. No, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't. But guess what? The program goes on to basically point out that he would rather admit to having an affair than to admit that he'd lost faith and didn't believe anymore in the things that he'd been led to believe. Now, that is staggering. Because I thought to myself, how honest must we be when we get to a place where we say, I have got to stand here and say, I don't know anymore. There are things that I don't know. That takes courage. And I am not saying that because I've got the microphone. I'm saying it for you guys too. It takes courage when for years we've said, black is black. And suddenly we're saying, well, actually, it's not as black as I thought it was anymore. Yeah? It takes courage. And I, and I want to make a statement tonight that I am 59 years old and I am going to be wine and not raisins. Now, some of you are going to say, well, I like raisins in my Christmas cake. Yeah, you can have them. I want the wine. Now, the Bible talks about wine making hearts glad. And the one thing I do know about my journey, and I am not forcing my journey on anybody else, but what I know about my journey is that my journey, and you're going to laugh at this because you're going to take it literally, but I'm talking figuratively as well. My journey lacked wine for a very long time. My religion, and I call it religion because that's what it was, it lacked wine. There was so much restriction, so much do's and don'ts and struggles that it lacked wine. And I've decided over the last 15 years that Jesus, when he said, I have come that you might have life and in all of its fullness, that was the wine. We have the picture of Jesus at the wedding at Cana turning water into wine. Why? And it's the, oh, look, I'm sidetracking now, but I love it when this happens to me. He used the pots that were used for ceremonial cleansing. He said, fill them with water and don't use them to be pious and wash your hands and prove that you're all holier than thou. He says, fill them with water and I'm going to make it so fermented that you're going to have some fun. Right? So you've got Jesus himself not so bothered about how clean people were, but that they were free. Now, my heart, I am absolutely anti-religion. And I don't care whether it's religion to do with church or, 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 or that sort of belief stuff, or religions. And you're going to say, oh, this is weird. I've never heard this before. We're all more religious than you, th you think. We're religious about the time we get out of bed. We're religious about the time we go to bed. We're religious about what we can watch on TV, what we can't watch on TV, what we can eat, what we can do. And it might have nothing to do with God at all. Right? Because we are God creators. We're not God rejectors. We've got thousands of gods that we can make in a split second and we bow and we worship. What Jesus came to do is to get rid of it all and say, you know what, you're all right as you are because I've loved you from the beginning and it is finished. Now, we put ourselves out of business with a message like that. But boy, is it good. Now, what are we about then? We're about providing a space where we can encourage people to be free of the bondages. Remember, religion, what it means is to return to bondage. That word means, it's actually a French word, rel guerre, and it's return to bondage. And of course, we say here, oh yes, but we're not religious. We've got a different thing going we can be just the same. We get into bondage. But I am telling you, I am becoming wine. I am not being a, gray, a, a raisin any longer. I am here now. Beth, thank you. You did it for me. 
because she said something in her, in her Facebook last week and she, she praised me and it was a lovely thing to do. She praised me for the passion I have to basically stand against all the, 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 the shackles of religion. And, and I thought, well, thank you. That was very, very kind. But she encouraged me to say, right, come on, Chris. Your letter is going to be greater because I'm not going to be intimidated by anybody anymore. And you know what it, what it is, you see? You think, yeah, this message is not as wanted, wanted it. People don't want this message as much. Also, oh, should we return to religion? Safer? No, I'm not going to do it. And you know what? I have lived now longer than the amount of life I've got left. Now, some of you will say, oh, that's a negative thing to say. I am not going to live another 59 years, am I? Do you think? Am I likely to be, what, what would it be? 118? Am I likely? I don't think so. If I get 20, I think I'll be doing all right. But are you following me? It, it makes you think, 20 years, what do I want to do with it? And I am saying I am not going to be intimidated anymore by anybody. I'm going to say what I feel. Now, authenticity. We all say, oh, I'm true to myself. No, we're not. We get freaked out. We want to be accepted so much. We want to be, be in the in crowd rather than saying, do you know what? I have got to be true to the word that's in my heart, haven't we? Got to be. Now, I've veered off my notes altogether, and you're going to say, well, yeah, you usually do, so shut up. Being honest is dangerous. When you're honest, it opens you up to be judged, doesn't it? If you're honest, remember the guy who said in, in that story a few minutes ago, he'd lost his faith. To say that was worse than actually admitting to an affair. Don't you find that amazing? Anyway, when Beth put, she, she said, I've never seen anybody with the passion to eradicate the hurt, pain, humiliation and misunderstanding people have experienced through religion. And I'm a force to be reckoned with. So what she said, and I thought, do you know what? I haven't been, but I'm going to be. I'm going to be a force to be reckoned with. Right. Some of you are going to say, yeah, but we haven't been like you. We haven't experienced what you've experienced. Well, I don't know if that's true. I think there's levels of it. And some of you think, well, you know, you know, you, I, again, I was watching something on the TV the other night, a program called The Sinner. Anybody seen it on Netflix? There you go. Go watch that one. L just get this. This is a devout Christian who unfortunately has given birth to a child who, who has a, uh, it's um, Hodgkin's disease, right? And um, the other daughter is fine. And she says to this daughter, get these words, you better live up to what we have to live up to, or otherwise your sister might die. So the little girl's on her knees every day praying because she fears that if she just doesn't live right, her, daughter, her sister will die. Her, her auntie gives her a bar of chocolate and she goes and hides it in her bedroom. Her mother finds it, right? Takes it to her and shows her it. She says, don't you give God a reason to punish us. It's chocolate, for goodness sake. And you think, well, nah, we're not like that. We don't believe like that. I'll tell you, more people live in terror of what they've been taught God is and what he might do if we just don't get it right, you're blessed because we've been teaching a more beautiful gospel for a long time. But I'll tell you what, it can make us very, very lethargic rather than saying, what are we doing? We ought, this place ought to be absolutely teeming. Not because we're being religious, but we're providing a space for people to have their chains broken. Do you get it? So this poor little girl has to bury, has to bury a chocolate in, in, in the garden to prove that she's repentant. I mean, I just, I couldn't believe it at all. Now you say, well, I don't believe like that. I'll tell you what, we all have, we, we all prove what our image of God is by the fears 
that we manifest. And you're going to say, no, that's not true. I tell you, it all comes down to our understanding of God. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing, but anyway. What we believe about God will dictate what kind of human being we are. I've said that many times. But also, the God we believe in is the God we will hear. Do you know, people who believe they've heard God to go into a place and machine gun everybody down, what God were they hearing? Do you get it? They believed in a God of, of anger, a God of wrath, a God of judgment. Yeah, they were hearing a God. But I'll tell you, it wasn't the Abba of Jesus. Do you get it? So what, the God that you hear, what's he saying? You'll soon, you'll soon know what, what God you're believing in. Anyway, I was going to just tell you a little bit about me. Some, so I know somebody else who has had an issue with this, but I'm just going to tell you something. When I was young, very young, I was given this. Now, I know you probably can't see it, but it's a little chick publication, and it's called A Demon's Nightmare. Anybody ever heard of it? No? You probably like to have a read. I will promise you won't lose it because I have kept this probably for 50 years, right? Shows you how I hoard. That's one of them. Right. But the thing is, when you read that story, when I look back at that now, I can truly say that that book had more influence on my image of God than anything I could think of. And guess what? The demons in it were always stronger than God. Always going to win. And you think to yourself, how did that get into my head and be what basically influenced me? As it did. And it did. It was, it was horrendous. Now, I realised that in order for me to be the wine and not the raisin. I've got to stop editing myself. Who edits themselves? Come on. It's a good phrase, that editing. Who self-edits? You're in a situation and you know what you want to say, but you're politically correct. Well, well, if I say that, they'll do this. Come on, we have got to learn to stop editing. Now, am I telling you to go and be horribly unkind to somebody? Of course not. But I am saying, let's be honest and true and be authentic, right? Stop editing ourselves. Because, here's the thing, change is constant, but so is grace. So the thing is, we have got to be willing to face change without us falling apart, because change does that, doesn't it? So my equilibrium is, let's say, what I've believed for 50 years, and then suddenly, I'm challenged with a thought that challenges everything. What am I going to do? Am I going to fall apart or am I going to allow the grace that goes along with that change to, to help me survive? You, is this making sense? I, I hope it is. So, change is interesting because security comes from our uh, sense of certainty, doesn't it? Um, but the paradox is, and listen to this, we hate the mundane. I hear so many people tell me how bored they are of, of life. And yet the moment you offer them something that's a bit off the beaten track, it's like, oh, no, I couldn't do that. Well, you're bored. You, you hate your life. Let's do something different. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. Do you get me? So we rely on it, the mundane, for our comfort, even though it is not doing us any good. Now, isn't that just unbelievable? Right, so I want you to put up a thing, because I don't know who this is for, but I really thought I was supposed to put this up tonight. Look at this. Trauma permanently changes us. This is the big scary truth about trauma. There is no such thing as getting over it. The five stages of grief model marks universal stages in learning to accept loss, but the reality is in fact much bigger. A major life disruption leaves a, a new normal in its wake. There is no back to the old me, right? You are different now, full stop. I am different now. Who's had a trauma in their life? Now, when I say a trauma, I mean a real trauma. 
I don't mean you just got up and you felt a little bit down. Who's really suffered a trauma? It might have been a divorce. It might have been a death in the family. It might be something of a loss of a job. I, I, you know, you hear what I'm saying? Who suffered one that, I'll tell you what, after something like that, it, it could be an illness, you are aware that it changes something in you, doesn't it? And you know there's no going back to the you that you were, right? So here's the point. Let's carry on with this. This is not wholly negative thing. Healing from trauma can also mean finding new strength and joy. The goal of healing is not a papering over of changes in an effort to preserve or present things as normal. It is to acknowledge and wear your new life. Wear it. Wear your new life. Warts, wisdom and all with courage. Now that's the point. Are we willing to wear our new life? Now you see, you might say, yeah, but I don't know if I like it. Tough. Tough. It's here to stay. Now, something else might happen which will change you again. And you might not like that fit either. Tough. But you can wear it, your new life. Warts, wisdom and all with Courage. Courage. Oh, isn't that awesome? Okay. This community allows all of you to have a journey that is totally unique to you. We don't have a set of beliefs. We don't have stuff that we say you've got to do all of this and believe all of this in order to be part of us. You have got your own journey and it will be totally different from mine. And I want to hear your journey. I want to hear your story. Because I'll tell you what, I sat with Jenny Taylor the other week, and I'm not kidding you, what she told me was like being hit in the face. Because I let her experience challenge my experience, and I had to say, do you know what? She's got something there, and I've got to think about that. Because it needs to permanently push out the bad in me or the wrong in me in order that I can move on to something greater. Now, I could not have done that if Jenny hadn't have at least been open and honest about what she felt and believed. We disagreed, didn't we, Jenny? We disagreed. Is that a problem? No. It's for our growth. It's how we learn. But the amount of people who take the ball home when you just don't agree for crying out loud. I asked somebody a little while ago, um, you know, can we, get, can we have a coffee together? Um, it would be nice to chat and talk about, because they'd, they'd come into the church once and, uh, you know, different background. I says, can we get, get, have a coffee? He says, well, I don't think there's any points, is there? I says, why? He says, well, I don't think we have anything in common. I says, I thought that's the reason why we should get together. I mean, isn't that the truth? I want to know your story because your story might actually give me something that blows my socks off. Come on, guys, in this place, let's get together to tell our stories, wear our life, trauma or no trauma, let's wear it and be honest about it. Okay, right, I've, I've gone off the beaten track a bit, but... I want to show a clip from the, the, the shack. And I've got to set it up a little bit, but I don't want to tell you all the story because the film is going to be on Wednesday night. But what we've got to be careful of is that our beliefs don't get beautifully boxed up and sellotaped up and, you know, uh, marked and then put under the eaves. I've got loads of boxes under my eaves. I have loads. I really do. I'm a right hoarder. But we can do that with our, our beliefs and our faith. And um, what this is, and I, and I just want to challenge you. I, oh, there was a, I probably should have put it on. There was a little joke, a meme, and it was Jesus and Buddha having a chat. And, the, and Buddha says, uh, I wish I'd sort of set up a rule that nobody could sort of basically uh, decide what I looked like. Uh, I'm, I'm only giving you sort of a, a basic thing. And uh, he says, because 
they always make me fat. Right? Buddha, you know. Which is true. I've never seen a skinny buddy yet, have you? No. I don't know where that came from. That would be interesting to find out, wouldn't it? A skinny Buddha? Well, why not a skinny Buddha? Jesus then says, you think you've got a problem. I've been a white, blonde, blue-eyed. Oh, it's there. There you go. Tell me about it. I've been a blonde, white dude for like 2,000 years. Now, you might think, well, I've never thought of it like that. The truth is, Jesus couldn't have been a white, blonde, blue-eyed dude. And yet the West has made him that. And then any challenge at all to it being different, then we get our knickers in a knot, don't we? And why? Because we have a static belief rather than a dynamic faith. Because I'll tell you what, and I'm not going to have time tonight because I've just gone silly. What has happened to me over the last 15 years is that I have gone from God being this dude here, right, to to, to a, a power and to a widened d dynamic that I would never have understood had it not been for a trauma that hit me between the eyes. And I'm grateful for that. So, without further ado, let's put on the, the clip, please. Thank you. Well, I hope that's whet your appetite for um, Wednesday night. It's made you all quiet. But you see, the issue for Mac was had, because of his experience, had he met God as a man at the beginning, he wouldn't have been able to handle because his experience of life, he had a brutal father. And you'll find out on Wednesday. I don't want to give it all away for you. but So we have a situation here, and you, you think, what's that all about? What I'm trying to basically show you, that what God as a male or a female or whatever, is wanting to do is take us all on a journey which is hand tailor-made for you where you're at, depending on your story that will make absolute sense for every step of the way. But you see, if what we do is box him off and make him a man in the beginning, and we don't need a man right now, then what are we going to do? We're going to hold him at arm's length because we say, I don't relate to that because I can't hack that. Or let's say that we've had an issue with a mother figure. Oh, I, ca I can't relate to that because, are, are you following me? So you see, let me tell you a little bit about, about, about my story. I've gone the opposite way. For me, I started out with God being very much a male, authority, uh, a controller, a judge, all the things that you would put into the box of a, of a God figure. And see, for me, you're going to find it really a bit, bit odd. That wasn't a picture of a, a father. It was actually a picture of a mother. Because my experience was my mother was the one who was very much the controller, the one who kept things in order that I had to please. So you see, even though I held God as being a man, it was really a picture of a woman. Now, don't you find that interesting? Right. And then I was in a very bad place 15 years ago, and yet God was still a male in that sense. It was a man. And yet, instead of being this judge and controller and punisher, etc., he became this father, this kind dad who would always overlook, whereas mother wouldn't, dad would. Do you get me? And in that moment where I needed the dad who didn't always stick up for me in life, right, because mum was the boss, in that moment, God was being my dad who was always so loving and kind and gentle is this making sense? And that changed my whole understanding because I had an encounter with that graciousness, that compassion, that, that love that wasn't out to get me when I was down. It was actually there to comfort me and lift me up. Do you, do you get it? So I saw the opposite. It was absolutely staggering. I expected my mother and I got my dad. I hope you're hanging with me here. Are you getting it? Because I think this is so important for you tonight. But guess what? As the time has gone on, I've found that actually I've gone from it being 
not really a person. And you're going to say, yes, but God is a person and he sent his son Jesus and your father, son and spirit. But actually, I see God now as more of a it. And you think, oh, can't do that. But you see, there's, a, there's a, a, a reason why we often make things personable because we think it's accessible, don't we? We, we personify things to make them grabbable. Do you get me? When things are, you know, it's like we, it loses it, its sense of accessibility, but it can also lose its greatness. Is this making sense? Right, so I have gone, and I know I gave you that very, very quickly. I have gone from a noun, a person, a thing, which was two separate entities, right? Because you've got God here, me here, that's the noun, the person, to being a verb, which is an energy, an action, that I'm not separate from, I'm actually one with. Now, everybody's going to say, oh, you're going the wrong way. No, I'm not. Because the thing is, when God's out there or up there or wherever, you're always trying to connect. You get on your knees, you pray, you do whatever. But when you're one with it and not separated from it, you find that all of the time you are in it are you getting it? It's amazing. Now, I'm not telling you that that has to be your journey, but I'm telling you that's what's happened with me and it's been quite remarkable. Now, let's take it this way. Some people start with it being an it and it's in a sense that they see it as this energy and this source, but they never get a look at a close-up picture of what it might look like. That's why the Bible talks about Jesus being the exact representation of the Father. Because he says, if you want something to grab and have a little bit of a look at, here you go. But if you box it down to this, you're going to make it so small that it's going to not be all that it should be. Now, is that making, making sense? So I think that we've a, a fantastic thing there in the sense that it's an energy. We're not independent of it we're one with it so listen to this and we'll probably bring it to an end religious people tend to believe God is a separate entity and that's why they look for something to worship to pray to to um, fear because they have that fear of it um, and they also serve it because it's separate are you with me but then spiritual people, get this, know that God is something that they are one with and just live it. Did you get it? Absolutely powerful, amazing this. So here's the thing. How can we build a community that has a whole bunch of people with unique journeys, with different perceptions of what God is like, who he is, whether he's, he's good or bad, because remember, we've all got different journeys. How do you build a community like that? I'll tell you what, you do it because it's not about what we believe. It's about what our end goal is, because our goal is something that's absolutely fantastic. It's our quest to get everybody understanding the union that exists, the divine love and to experience an inner aliveness. Inner aliveness. Okay. Soul abundance. And then we encourage each other to generously serve. And we would say, oh, it's serve God. No, we serve each other and we serve the world. Very different, isn't it, from all this where we're serving God, we do. No, we serve each other. If everybody was to serve each other, I'll tell you what, you'd soon stop most of the wars, wouldn't you? Serve each other. So anyway, I believe I've gone my journey for a reason. Because some of you speak my language. There's some of you in here who've gone a different journey, but you're staying quiet. And that's not fair. 
I want you to start telling your stories. I want you to share. Please share. We need to hear. People need to hear you speak and tell of your understandings and what you've come to because it might deliver people into the union, right? The divine love and the incredible inner aliveness that they are looking for. So I just want to say a couple more things. The church is often likened to a hospital for sick people, um, which is quite a nice picture. But I think I would prefer for us to think of this place as a detox center. And I'll tell you why. Because the toxic beliefs that we have had about God need to be cold turkeyed away. Scary. You shake. A guy that I follow on um, Facebook, he says this, letting go of the toxic things we believe about God doesn't bring us to the end of our faith. It brings us to the start of it. Don't you think that's amazing? And you might be a bit like Mac on the, on the film where he's looking and he's saying, everything that I have learned, everything that I thought that, that I understood is all absolutely higgledy-piggledy in a right mess. Imagine somebody... And I'll tell you what, I'll be honest with you. In the States, when this came out, there was, a, there was an uproar because God was um, shown as a black female. Now, you might think, what? Grow up? Yeah, I'm just telling you, that's what religion does because it will always fight against anything that might connect with you and bring you into that union. You know why? Because religion doesn't want to cure for your problem any more than the pharmaceuticals want to cure for cancer. Did you know that? Religion doesn't want you ever free. But whoever God, it, her, him is, does. And that's the good news of the gospel. So, we want to awaken you to the awareness of what? This union that already exists. It's not something that, that we have to run after, that we have to grasp. It already exists. We just have to wake up to it. This divine love. And we want everybody to experience this inner aliveness in order that we might generously serve each other and the world. I'm done. Was there anything else I had to show? Are we done? Nah, we're all right. We're done. Okay, so we're done. Um, we've got a song, haven't we, to do the offering to. Uh, offering, so we're going to pay it forward. Say offering. Still talk old language, don't I? Pay it forward. You're not paying for anything tonight, really. You're not paying for anything. You are giving in order to create a place where people can come and be told what they already are, what they've already got. Isn't that just amazing? It's amazing? Okay, so let's sing this. We're going to sing, if we're honest, actually. Bit of a quiet song to end on, but actually, let it... Ask yourself the question tonight. Am I being honest to who I should be, to where I am? Am I a raisin or am I wine. And have I boxed God off? Have I, am I allowing him to be small in my life? Or am I willing to actually allow this just widening experience and understanding? As we're singing this, let's have some honesty, shall we? Should we have a bit of honesty? Yeah, thanks. You're always on my side. I, I love you, treasure. You're wonderful. Let's have some honesty because it will set us free. Um, and it's where we need to be. So, right. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others. <laughs>